Hello and welcome to the Mebo Podcast. Whether you're starting out and have never hit record once in your life, or if you're working on your next big budget film, we want to provide you with the best tactical tips, tools, and pieces of advice to make sure that the next time you hit record, you're ready to go. Today I have one of our mentors, I think is the best way to put it. I mean, you've been incredible as a resource to us as we've grown Mebo Productions um, over the years and couldn't be more blessed to have Xavier with us today. So to intro this, I'm bringing Justin on because there's a great story about how we connected <laughs> and how we know each other. So Justin's going to come onto the Correct. set here and kind of tell that story because I think I don't do it justice because it didn't really involve me. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> All right. Um, I just wanted to start it off with the story of how we met you guys. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> So first time I met Xavier, um, we were doing a project at Spaces downtown, and I left my tripod in the car. So I run down to the car, grab my tripod, I'm running up, and I walk past this guy. He kind of looks at me. I look at him. All right, that was it. I get down to the end of the hallway, and I felt these eyes on the back of my head. So I turn around, and the guy is staring at me still. And I'm like, what in the heck? So I'm like, whatever. So a few more minutes go by, I'm setting up, getting everything going, and the guy's walking towards me now. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, what is going on? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm getting stalked, and I'm like, well, maybe, just maybe this guy's like interested in what we do, and just want, like maybe he needs a video. So. And Spaces is a nice place, and you don't hit a tripod, so you ain't getting jumped. Right, right. <laughs> right so I... um. I start talking to him. I start my sales pitch. I'm like, maybe he needs a video. And we start talking. Then he has this French accent. And I'm like, all right, this is getting, this is kind of wild. So we talked for a little bit really shortly. I still didn't know what, what it was. And he was like, do you have a card? And I, we exchanged information. And I let it go. It was over. All right. <laughs> Ten minutes later, bing, I get an email from this guy. And I'm like, what is going on? I want to go in. In between that, Justin comes up to me because I'm setting up the set for where we're shooting. And Justin comes up to me like, this guy just <laughs> followed me and was like staring at me. And yeah. it was just like, like peeking weird. around the corner of the hallway. <laughs> like <laughs> I just I didn't know what to think, what to do. Yeah. But he has my card. So I guess we might hear then, from him. And then I start looking at your email and your tag, and I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's a filmmaker. So that's why he was interested. And um, I don't know, an hour and a half later, we came up to your office, which you were in spaces, and you divulged some of your story, which we're going to hear today. And, and you ended up being one of the most <laughs> important people for us in our journey. And uh, it was just a very <laughs> funny, funny intro to meeting you, man. But what you don't know is that I saw you loading your car in Greenfield where you live. I followed you from... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it goes deeper. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that um, I'm out of here now. No, but just to justify my weird, my weird behavior oh, yeah. is that I was, you know, it was during COVID. I yep, just moved yep. to Milwaukee and I was really excited about meeting fellow filmmakers or... So every time I would see a tripod on the street or a bag that looked like a camera bag, I would, I would arrest the people, just look at them. Get the, that's we what I was excited. Flattered. You know? We weren't yeah. at all weirded out. We were very flattered. So Because you don't know, so I did a pass. You guys didn't see me. I did a pass in front of the, the office I'll, where you were sitting up <laughs> to look at the gear. <laughs> Make sure we're legit enough to have a conversation yeah, exactly. with. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, well, yeah. So Justin alluded to a little bit. Take us just briefly through your journey. I mean, you're... That accent is is voluptuous to people that love the French accent, and and you know you you started in, you were born in France, obviously, came to L.A., which you know we'll kind of get into what you got into there, and then to Milwaukee. So how did that whole situation know, right? play out? My goodness, I know. Sometimes I look at myself. I'm like, what, what? How? From France to Milwaukee? <laughs> yeah. Where? How the heck? No. So what happened? I was uh, I went to L.A. to become an actor. Because I loved acting. So I went there, signed up into an acting school that at the same time gave me a visa that allowed me to stay. So that was great. And I fell in love with acting. And But then after a few years, I was, you know, typecast as a French guy, French accent, French waiter. So it was not really making sense as far as a career. And then I got married as I needed to make some steady money. So I decided to go into, uh, I wanted to stay in the world of movie and TV. So I said, you know what, I'm going to reach out to the people that I met. And, and eventually I got a gig as a PA, production assistant, in a, in a pre, very good production company 
And I said it was very good because the work they did was very good. And also the, the, the variety of clients that they had was awesome. That's why I got a chance to work with Disney, with Disney, ABC Family, E! Entertainment, CBS. I mean, that was crazy. I worked also on the, I never told you that I worked on the redesign of the, uni, you know, the Universal Globe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like that logo animation? We worked on, oh my I was gosh. part of the team that okay. we, we did the, in 2004, I guess. They had the redesign of the yeah. Globe. Now I was like, oh my God, I'm, I was not doing much at the time. It was just a PA, but just, you know, being involved in Having that process. Out, you was feel awesome. like it's yours. Yeah. I mean, you take ownership of anything yes. that you're working on. So that's what happened. And then that, you know, the, also the thing is, I was an older guy to be a PA. PAs are usually, you know, in their early 20s. And I was all, older. So I realized I had no time to waste. So I was really vigilant to my work. I was working hard. I was, you know, getting coffees, getting lunch. I played the game. And then quickly, they realized I had some potential, I guess. And I quickly became associate producer. It gave me more responsibilities on shoot, coordinating shoots, you know, with the clients, with the vendors, with booking. If we needed a crane, you know, I would contact people. Could be casting, you know, setting up a casting, setting up a, any, any type of pre-production work. And then we all would also handle the post-production work, which was awesome. So I was associate producer producer for pre-production and post-production. So I would really see the overall, you know, how the magic happens. And then after a few years, uh, less than I mean, like a year or two, I realized that associate producer was leading me to becoming a producer, mm. which involved a lot of emails, a lot of meetings, a lot of personal interactions, a lot of BS, schmoozing, which was not my cup of, cup of tea. And uh, at the same time, I would see the editors, you know, in, in the edit room. And I was like, man, that's where the magic is happening. I mean, we spent six months to work on that shoot, on the pre-production. And the guys got a week to make sense of all the, what, three dozens of people have been working on. He's in the room here. He's got a week. He's going to make sense of it. And all the mistakes that have been made in pre-production, there's always, you know, mistakes on yeah. the shoot, things. Yeah. It's still going to happen. And the guy is under a lot of pressure, you know, as the countdown goes down. And I was like, that's cool. So I started to follow the editors and learn the process of being an assistant editor, which is the way in LA you have to be an assistant editor first. And then I got a shot that, the, no, I didn't get the shot actually in that company. That company wanted me to become a producer. So they said, no, there's no. So I quit my job with no leads. I just quit. I said, I need to find a job in a post house. Quit and then within within two months I found a gig for uh, TLC, the mm -hmm. Learning Channel, uh, to be an assistant editor on a huge show. Oh my God, they had like they were shooting all over the world, so they had like all the types of PAL, uh, NTSC, oh, no. six and by nine, four and by oh three, plus the Chinese format, the Australian. Yeah. Oh my God! But after six months, I became the like my work and I became a lead assistant editor, and it got me even closer to the editors. So that's where I really fell in love with editing because again, here you have to kind of make a choice where assistant editing can become a full-time job, mm -hmm. like really good assistant editors don't even, they're not even looking forward to becoming an editor because it's a f totally different job. Like editors on Hollywood movies, they, that's assistant, they're just, that's what they do. And edit editors have their preferred assistant editor because that guy, is on, they're more like tech nerds troubleshooters and also like their, how do you call that, D -C 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 -D -D? O -C -C? when you like, like things to be organized and... Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that, what is it, OCC, OCD? OCD. OCD, yep. yeah, because they, they got their shit organized and... Yeah. So anyway, and that was not where my brain is. My brain is more creative, so I was like, you know what, another path to choose. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go f head full on to becoming an editor. Again, I quit my job, no leads. And uh, talk to the people I met in the past. And someone said, yeah, I know someone at uh, MGM and they might be looking for a young assistant slash junior editor. Say, do you, how much you want to make? I said, I don't care. <laughs> just, just the word MGM. I'm like, fine. Yeah. <laughs> and got the job. I mean, I interviewed, got the job. And that was my first gig as an, as an editor, being alone in my editing room, dark room like here, working with a producer. And then the journey started, you know, you build a reel and then, you know, slowly you move on to work for another studio, another production company and 
And then, yeah, and then to make it to the end, then I studied, you know, I did that for 15 years. My career, I mean, I should say also there's another path I had to take. I was in the world of what we call promo. In Hollywood, you have promos, commercials, and film. Yep. So those three worlds, we have the same titles, editors, but there's no tunnel, no bridge in between. Okay. So you better make your choice early on on the, you know, on the, on the highway. Make mm-hmm. sure you take the right exit because yep. then to move from one side to the other, it, it, it's it's not impossible. When, when you're older in the game, it's like you have to bite the bullet. And as an editor, I had the opportunity to work in film. But the guy told me, you're going to have to be an assistant editor, not mm-hmm. even a lead assistant. You're going to have to go down the ladder. Are you ready to climb the ladder? I was like, no, I did not. So yeah. it's something very interesting to know for for the listeners and the viewers. Like you got to start to figure out what you really like to edit, work on, because then it's hard to 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 cross that bridge. You have to build the bridge. And anyway, so I uh, realized, you know, after 15 years, I, I kind of reached a lot of my professional goals. You know, I worked with pretty much all the major studios. I worked with pretty much all the TV networks, I think. So I was like, what do I do? And then COVID, COVID happened. Yeah. COVID really, I was like, oh man, what do I do? Do we stay here to look for what? And then what I should say also in the meantime, when I started to feel like my career was reaching a plateau, I started to get into filmmaking, independent filmmaking, mm-hmm. which was cool because all my acting career, kind of a, you know, being behind the camera, in front of the camera, then behind the camera, everything kind of merged together and make a lot of sense actually. And then you're know, dealing, working with directors on set. I was like, oh my God, I know what they're talking about. I know what they are not talking about. So I realized, it, yeah, I mean, I got also a good eye. You know, I learned for 15 years to have a good eye to compose a shot, to recompose a shot that was not composed correctly, you know. And also, you know, you give the pace to the spot, even if it's a 30 second or a 60 second spot, you still give, you have to create the pace and the energy and the. The, the beauty also, the, the, the beauty of the, the, of the spot itself, you know, the visual. So I was like, maybe I can do something into filmmaking. And I did. I studied again to reach out to the connections that I had. Yeah. Did a couple of free gigs, as, free gigs as a GP, you know. And then I studied to direct. I worked for a friend who's an actor, who's actually is now on HBO. So the guy is known in, in the yep. business and we've been friends for 25 years. So he wanted to start his own uh, little show. So we shot the pilot for him. He didn't lead anywhere, but it was a great experience. We worked with some people. There was a chance for me to be the DP and the director and then reach out to some local uh, stores and companies and I shot a, a local commercials for Cadillac of Beverly Hills. You know, it was a big client. It was yep. cool. Yep. And then, you know, people said to reach out to me and nothing big, you know, like 10 to 30 grand budgets, but it was like a small replica of a small set, you know. You got your crew, you got your client that you cherish and take care of, yep. all the things that I've learned. And it was awesome. And then uh, there was a time for me to, then COVID happened. So, all you know, all that career switch, that new inspiration, filmmaking, COVID, being closer to my family, because my wife was from Milwaukee originally, yep. we had family, my granddaughter is in Milwaukee. We're like, let's go work for the summer in Milwaukee. And the summer turned into, man, that's so cool here. We sold the house in North Hollywood and moved permanently to Milwaukee. Found a spot in uh, in the space in spaces yeah. to uh, my little office, and and then I went hunting to find uh, talents or to find put to find potential. I said, I'm sure there are people around here. There are writers, there's filmmakers, there are editors, and not only maybe I can share my knowledge, you know, that'd be cool, but so I can do some collaboration. Mm-hmm. I think the the most valuable thing that, so I had a business before, you know, me and Bill Productions, and it was so Milwaukee in general, and I love this city, and I will, I, I plan to stay here for, for long term, but, you know, it's very, everybody's at each other, you know, and when we met you, we're like, holy shit, like, this guy's coming from LA, has worked with Disney, all these companies that, you know, young guns like us in Milwaukee, especially yeah. Smart City, like aspire to be part of those things. And you're just like, let's just bring everybody together. Let's get the best talent. Let's put it all in one room and let's just do some great stuff. Like what, tell me about that experience, like from LA 
I'm sure you probably have a pretty similar opinion about the landscape of Milwaukee, but what is the difference between the two landscapes that you've noticed and, and, and what's the solution? Yeah, I mean, come to answer what you said about the way you saw how I came across, it's because when I came here career-wise, I was good. I was not looking for, let's get a show that's going to be on HBO, let's get a shoot a commercial for Coke. I was like, you know, I mean, not that it's not that I've done it all. You know, I've done what I stopped when I felt I did mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. You know, yes, I could have done more. I like to compare myself to a guy who played in the NBA. You don't know his name. You know, right. I'm not Kobe Bryant. I'm not whatever. It's one of those guys, you know, baseball, whatever, major league like this. You don't know everybody. I worked at that level. Now I'm good. You know, I'm going to come here, you know, share my knowledge. And I'm not going to be like, oh, shit, they're working for that guy. I need right. to get that gig. No, I'm going to help not only help because i want to get something out of it you know there's something is not money there's something eventually money yeah of course but it's more the collaboration being open to young people who are hungry who are exposed more to the new technology than i am you know i'm getting you know not older is not a word but older school so I, that we don't always have in la because the budgets are so big that people like you don't have a voice you know right. so here you have a voice and companies like you and kind of run the show here. You, I know you, I never told you that, but you run the show more than you think you do because the big companies in Milwaukee, their work sucks because they think they know what they're doing. They're lucky because they have the clients that they've had for 30 years. The clients don't really know. They believe, you know, when they see lots of cameras and lots of gears, okay, they must be good. I'm getting my money's worth. Yeah, but that's not, that, no. So you guys don't know but you kind of rule the game you're the future of cities like here you know because the more we're getting into social media the, the formats in the uh, nine by nine by six nine by six. 16 nine, nine by 16, 16 by yes, nine yeah. horizontal nine yeah, by 16 yeah, yeah, right <laughs> you know all those that stuff that's the future you know yeah. and you guys know instagram you guys are great at it and uh so where was i going with my point so so the difference yeah i mean you still get the same competition as you get in la of course but here it's on a smaller scale and there's way less people, you know, the competition. But at the same time, the competition is less, but the the gigs, the potential of gigs is smaller too. So yeah. that's what I was explaining to you guys. It's kind of, a, I, I almost feel bad in a way because I'm like, those guys in general are working so hard, but what, for what? That's right. what I'm, right from the beginning, I said, let's do something. Let's get those people from Chicago. Because I, I worked here collaborated with a couple big companies here, mm -hmm. uh, production companies, and they would say, yeah, now we can get those gigs because uh, they all want people, directors from L.A. They want the I'm one of yeah. those guys. Yeah. So why don't we use the French thing, L.A. experience? Like, that's all it takes, you know? So when I saw you guys with all that potential, I'm like, I want them to understand, to reach higher, you know? Like, go go get those people in Chicago, you know? you Nobody has to know that you're in Milwaukee. You know, present yourself as a big production company, build your reel, be ambitious, be hard, work hard, and then, you, then you're going to get those clients. And then Milwaukee is going to become a real a hub of, you know what, strong, solid gigs. One day we're going to build a, a freaking uh, studio where we can shoot, you know, like 30, high, 30 feet high ceiling. Like, yeah. That's what I see in Milwaukee, you know, that I don't see in L.A. because L.A. is saturated and... You need to in LA eventually, but maybe not. Maybe you do the thing here in, in Milwaukee because I think it can be done. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously we're trying our best to galvanize the city and I think it's so easy for people to look, you know, we are a business. We have to put food on the plates for our family. So like we have clients, but, you know, recently Justin's done a lot of the head work on this, but I've kind of followed a little bit of just like meeting people fresh out of college or doing mm -hmm. their seniors projects. And it's like, incredible to see you know i i own a business so i'm coming from the client side but justin's working on getting that creative side and it's like there are so many people that just love doing what they do mm -hmm. are good at it and it's exciting to see because i think it's such a bright future here but i i think the the valuable thing is i don't want people to get scared that there's not enough work because i think there's always work to be had i don't know if people are just you know, don't have the skills to go get that work or are afraid of no's. I don't know what that answer is, but you know, it, it's, it's exciting to see what the future is because there's, you know, there's so many fish in the sea for lack of a better term in terms of like clients and 
you know, people are so hell bent on like competition and this and that. And it's like, there's so many amazing companies that are built in Wisconsin, built in Milwaukee that need stuff done. There's so many possibilities for people to get clientele that, you know, if, if somebody from, I don't know, Washington state hires us, like we're not opposed to going and flying out Mm. and getting a job done. Like, it's not like you're locked into the zip code that you're working within. So it's, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I, I just I'm excited for the future of Milwaukee. No, but I think you, you you said something that that's good. I never really thought about that uh, until you almost you said half of it. Is that what's happening now? So companies don't really know what they want and what yeah. they need because they know that the you know marketing marketing tools are changing. There were of course social media, but things are changing. Like you know, like Twitter suddenly disappeared. What do you do when you rely heavily on Twitter? Yeah. They, so people are, especially, you know, the bigger the company, usually the kind of older school and the more resistant to changes people are. So at the same time, they don't really know what they expect from the creators. And sure. the creators, you know, the younger creators, they're like, I know one thing, like, I, you know, because also the tools have been made so easily available, mm-hmm. you know, cameras. And so everybody thinks they're a filmmaker coming out of school. Then they kind of realize, am I really... So they don't really know what their offer is at the same time, you know? And then the, you have the client that doesn't really know what the their demand is. So there's yeah. like two things where it's like, I don't know what I want. I not really don't know what I'm offering. I don't have the experience and I don't know if I have the tools. So that's why it's kind of interesting too, you know? Because so we work with both sides. Yep. We work with, with companies that are like, take it. Just tell us what's going to happen. Yep. Sweet. We also have companies that are like, we don't want you touching any of that creative. We know exactly what we want. Here's what you're going to do yeah. for us. We like both. Both fit. Like we we love being able cuz like I said we're a business we have to put food on our plate. So like we don't mind doing those things because we know that whenever there's a, a chance we're going to utilize those resources, the relationships. I mean the commercial that you helped us, you know, you got BTS for. Mm-hmm. That was one client that is a school district and a client that needed kids and we're like Boom. But I don't know if that's something that people are are readily open to consider. Yeah, I mean, that you, you I think those things you find out also as you build your business, you know, I think it's good to ask yourself a lot of questions. You know, it's part of looking into your 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 market. So we don't, I mean, I don't have the answers, obviously, but I don't think anybody has the answers, but I think what's right. good, as long as you keep asking yourself those questions, then it means that you're exposing yourself to different things, which I, I think for me is key. Just be open, reach out, be open to collaboration, create collaborations. Sometimes don't collaborate, just be open, just work, just realize that every time you're working on your craft, you know, it's like you go do your run every day, you're getting ready for the game that you don't even know if you're going to make it to the game, but you, yeah. just, you know, it's kind of the same thing. You just keep practicing your craft, practicing your, you guys as a binome, you, one is more the business side, the other one is more the tech side, whatever, creative. Each work, you know, at your thing, keep growing, keep, keep, and then eventually the, you're going to be like, oh, sh- crap, yes. Like with my career, I had no idea that one day I'd be, when I didn't mention one of my spot got, made it to the top 50 spot of the year. Okay. Top 50 promos, promos you have maybe like 600 a day. Yeah. So do that by the year, maybe yeah. like 300,000 spots. And my made it to the top 50. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. You know, I would have, you would have told me that 10 years before, like, I don't even know what or word, or word you're talking about. So anyway, to bring it back to what my point is that as long as you keep, you know, you're open to anything and you work hard on your craft, Things that are, they will not only come your way, you're gonna get to the things, you know. So I think that's why you guys are here in Milwaukee. Like, yeah, cooperate, keep learning, talk to people like me. Don't take everything people like me say for, you know. There's some BS in it, probably. There's some. I, I mean, there's take the more the more opinions that you have, though. Yeah. You obviously, you know, it's it's up to yourself to not be so hard headed about what feedback is coming in. But like when we first had our conversation, you know, you showed us some stuff that you would work on. We showed you our reel. You had already seen some of our work once we mentioned that that was right, us. And that it's was, like, yeah. you know, it was, it was cool to get a perspective of somebody that, that works so hard in an edit to, to be able to say, okay, this is where 
this is what I like, this is what I don't like. And Justin and I are, are strong enough to, to be able to say, I agree or I disagree. And, you know, again, everything has its own intentionality. Yeah. So maybe you're thinking of it, but whatever. But it's, it is, I think, important to have your ears open because you never know when something is going to be yeah. something that you're like, oh my gosh, like three years from now, you'd be like, man, I remember when I heard this piece of feedback yeah. and now suddenly I'm, I'm, you know, it's in the back of my head. It's just happening in every project I'm working on. Which is hard because especially when you're young and in, in a creative world, you know, it's hard to be, I mean, you, yeah, you still have to be strong about your vision, of course. At the same time, you have to be open to feedback, to things that might not go your way. So mm -hmm. it's hard because creative is not... How, how am I going to tell you that it's wrong? Because the word wrong doesn't really apply, you know? I'm going to tell you that it's not working when you think it is, you know? There's, it, nothing is really tangible. So at the same time, you have to be strong and feel strong and solid about your creative vision. At the same time, you have to be not weak is not the right word, but you have to be open to not weak, but... ah. What's the other word? I mean, yeah, I, I know what you're trying to say. Like you, vulnerable. Yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. have to still make yourself vulnerable to shit. Maybe I could have done different or doesn't different doesn't mean better. I could have you're, done different. You're like, not shitting gold every time yes, you have to go to the bathroom. Yes. And I think people need to understand that. Yeah. And yeah. So so we're we're kind of getting to that. So what 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 did you learn as an assistant editor that you know you think might have been some of those big valuable lessons to take you to getting that top 50? Uh, as an assistant, I mean, I learned about being, a, you say, rigorous? Rigorous? Yeah. A, a rigor. Yeah. Like you have to be super organized, super, you have to uh, cover your ass so many times as far as saving files. Because mm -hmm. it only takes the one time. You're going to, for 10,000 times, your media is going to be safe. And the one time it's not, that's it. It's gone. And you don't even need that one time. Why? Especially nowadays, it's super easy to back up. So like su being super organized, super backup, 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 backup. I know it's something that you hear all the time, but it's Three, two, so one. fucking true. Yes. Three, two, one. You have to. So yeah, be organized. Be uh, Communication is very important because when you work with, a, with an editor, you know, you have to be able to understand what he needs more than him understanding what you need or what you're trying to mm. say. So communication is key. Understand what he needs, what he's saying. And uh, troubleshoot. Troubleshooting is, a, as an assistant, that's that's what they need you for. Organize you know, the media and troubleshoot. If there's a problem with a computer, with a, the with a files, a conversion, you know, you have mm -hmm. files coming from all over the place. What's the best codec to use? What's the best uh, media source? How do we, where do we store it? What's... Some, sometimes, uh, I mean, most of the, every time, actually, the, the production company is going to ask you what codec you want us to use. <clears throat> They're very open. Right. And the question usually ends up on the editor. What codec should we use for that format? You know, so things are very technical things uh, that you need to know. So the, that, that, that's what I learned in the system being super organized, super rigor and uh, super against, again, OCD. And that's what, uh, yeah, that, that, those are the key things. But we don't, those jobs don't exist in Milwaukee. Assistant well, that, yeah, I, I, I think that was, as you were talking kind of about your journey, I'm just thinking back in my head, like, dang, that, that, that path really doesn't, not yet, <laughs> but it doesn't really exist here. Yeah. So take us through what makes a good edit. So what I make, it's one of the worst thing because it's almost like what makes a good sauce, you know, when you're in a kitchen, like you take the, the sauce that the chef just mm. made. It is opinion based, but but what I mean, we can be just high level key. Oh, no, no, I, like, I, yeah, I have yeah. an answer, but I'm saying yeah. that's what makes it so hard to explain editing because when you take the sauce, it's hard to say like, oh yeah, I love the I love the onion that you put in there. Right. So it edit is the same thing, like probably something that you all have heard before. You sh you don't even notice an edit. That's all kill. You don't notice an edit. You don't know there's an edit. You don't even talk about an edit after you watch something. You know, because then if you start to talk about the edit, unless it was intentional, like those spots that are super editing, this flash mm -hmm. cuts everywhere, they make the, the, the cut like trailers. Yeah. Are all about, I mean, less and less, actually, they, they, depending on the movies. There was a period like in 90s or early 2000s where it was super choppy cuts, like yeah, it was definitely. lots of effects in the transition. That was all about the edits. So a good edit, it's like when you watch a good movie, you don't 
talk about edit. You don't talk about the edits. So now how to get to that point, that's the freaking years of experience that it takes to understand that every even a 10 second thing has a beginning, a middle and an end. Yeah. And then the, the visual, the flow of the visual has to be created. The flow or the unflow. You know, you can create the flow is, you know, the, 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 the images just go together. And if you want to, what I call the unflow, if you can do that on purpose, you know, it's like a jump cut is a good example mm -hmm. of an, what I call an unflow. There's a jump cut, you know, I'm drinking my cup, but you make an edit in the between, between the time the cup gets to my lips, you know, so we start here and now the next cut is here. That's what I call, it's an unflow. Yep. There's, but there's a reason for that, you know, there's going to be a reason in your cut to do that. If there's no reason, yeah, probably some friends are going to say it looks cool. But if you don't, and you should not have to tell me what's the reason, you know, that should play by itself in the spot. There's a reason why there was a jump cut. We're cutting time. We want to create a sense of emergency, you know, in that spot. So those are the things that you learn with the craft. And uh, also we had the luxury to work with producers in a room. So okay. producer, you know, comes with a storyline. It's like the director in a movie. They have the storyline for you. So then you put things together for them. And they also you have a live feedback that you don't have when you guys work alone on your cut. It's your eyes, and it's going to be your wife's eyes, at mm -hmm. best, you know, your best friend, or in your case, at least you guys work together, but still you have the same vision from the same company. Right. So it's, you don't have that eye with a producer who's dealing with the clients. He knows exactly what they're going to want. So that's a luxury that here you don't have, and that's hard to get, you know, that last pair of eyes that's based on experience and knowing exactly what, what we're after. So that's... That's a luxury. So a good edit, that's what it is. Good edit is to know, to know your footage, know what you have. Because the tendency is to go quick to, quick to picking a few shots that you remember from the shoot. Oh, yeah, I know this one was good. And you start to build your, your sequence too early. And then you kind of marry to those shots. And then it's hard to get, or, oh, maybe there's something better than that. You, you're not even there anymore because you just remember that shot that was good. You don't even think that it could be something better. Or, I suffer from that. And better doesn't mean, I mean, I would say there's different, there's better, mm -hmm. like a better angle for the same action, but maybe there's different. But no, you can even see different because you're just stuck on that. So first know your footage and give a chance to every cut. Give a chance to every cut, every, 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 uh, every scene that you shot. Give them a, a shot, you know, watch that scene. You know, watch each clip I should deserve for you to screen it. Because you don't know something might make sense that didn't make sense on the day of the shoot because you didn't need it. But now that you're studying to, you've seen different things, it's like, oh shit, that, you know, like the typical thing in interviews, like now the great shots are before and after action yeah, and cut. you hit record a minute and a half before the yeah, interview starts. You because the guy, roll you know, the guy, I mean, half. you know that, yeah. that trick, you know, the guy becomes more relaxed and more, I'm going to interact with something mm -hmm. outside the set. So we know that, but it's kind of the same idea with those uh, things that, scenes that you didn't get what you wanted, but maybe you get something else. So give a chance to each clip, you know, do your home, yeah, homework, take the time to screen. Then organize, that's the way I work and yep. most people work. You should have sequences for, I'm talking about like promos, commercials, you know? Yep. That's, so you should have, un, uh, unless like what you guys do very well, you already, um, your, oh, your shoots are ready. You have already all your... Um, Selects? No. Oh. You already know what you're going to shoot. You call that, that's going to be cut in post. Uh, <laughs> that's what you Vision think. board. You have your vision <laughs> yeah, board. yeah, yeah. Everything is ready. So you already know what you're after, you know? Yeah. So I'm talking more about if you're shooting a... Uh, wait, 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 cut. Where am I going with that? What was it? What storyboard? I storyboard, that's the word. Yeah, I'm talking about... The, oh, yeah, create the sequences. Yeah, sequences. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Sequence with storyboards and... <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, the sequences, when do. you... It's more like when you work on, I would say, a movie. Because when you have a storyboard, that's my point. Yeah. When you have yeah. a storyboard, like you guys do very well, it's a little easier because you already made the edit before. And you're, the more experience you get, the better your storyboard's going to be. The client also approved the storyboard, so they already have the vision of what they're expecting. So usually you stick to that. So it's easier to go through your, create your selects and create the best of the first mm -hmm. shot, the best of the second shot. Now, if you're working like 
short movies or documentary style like you don't really know what you have it's you just shot you know because sometimes documentary you don't you don't know what's going to come so that's when you need to be organized with your sequences you know create a sequence with the best close-ups sequences with the best uh white shots best uh i don't know if there's something that happened during uh you know anyway like be very specific about mm -hmm. each sequence so then you know when you're building your your story your, your final sequence and you have those bins better than beads you have shots that are really ready for you you know yeah. instead of going back to a clip and hoping you're going to find the marker yeah, if, if you if you have any spot you know oh i've got this sequence already yeah, built out of all yes. these things i just need to find which one i want here exactly yeah. yeah so very true for short especially movies you know short movies where you have several takes build the the best build the best of the best sequences with the best uh here what we call hero shot you mm -hmm. know the, the perfect close-up and of the sequences, it's like drawers, and then you, I can pull in that drawer. It's labeled already, but the problem is that it takes time. You, you, I think you got to do it; otherwise, you're gonna let things on the side. It's funny, Justin. And I do edit very differently. I, I will meticulously go and I'll like, like, let's say we have interviews. I'll cut out everything that's not part of an answer, and then I have a timeline that's just yeah. all of the answers. Justin will just do it. He'll have the. The questions or the you know the storyboard and he'll go through and all right here's this and he'll do it linearly yeah whereas i'm like all right i don't and and i would say that's arguably more my fault but that's just how i work because it's like he knows he, justin has a much better idea of like he can see it start to finish whereas i'm like maybe i take a little bit too long to give some things too much of a chance i mean you said <laughs> it's good but maybe sometimes i let it go a little too far but it's it's interesting because you know when we have projects that we are in full control of like you said the pre-production is the way by far the most important part because we already know when we go to bed before yeah, the right. shoot day what that's going to look yeah. like we can picture it all in our heads whether or not you know we got approvable that doesn't mean that it's going to be what is on tv mm -hmm. at the end of the day um, but it's interesting because there's such a different level of confidence in the edit when you have shot all of the footage when you've been in pre-production mm -hmm. so what is it like when you haven't done all that and you're getting everything with a very strict, mm -hmm. this is what I need. I mean, you said you work with producers and it's live feedback, but what is it like when you're kind of seeing things for the first time when you're like, I mean, you have experience on all parts of production. Mm -hmm. So you're like, you know, they, they probably could have done that there, or this, you know, so how does that play out? So that's a good question because that's another reality, you know, and a reality that you might meet here one day, you know, some people might say, clients say, you know what, our editor disappeared. You guys are a post house, production house. Can you edit that? So, yeah, I mean, that's part of the one of the skills that you develop is that you take your time. I mean, first of all, you need to know how much time you have. Mm -hmm. You know, that's always the first question. I can do anything, but how much time do I have? When do you need the first, first one is delivery? And when do you need the first cut by? Because that also guides, you know, how much work you can do. And then, uh, the more experience you have, the stronger you can be, you know, not stronger, but more firm with the client, you know, to bring the expectations to reality, you know. If you give me 300, 300 hours of footage and you want me to give you a cut in two days, you should, the math, you know, I'm going yeah, to... Literally, much, I'm not able to do that. It's, <laughs> it's not humanly possible. So that's when you, when you're young, it's harder, you know, so you do... You want to be a yes man. So you're a yes man, which is okay because, you know what, you then... You learn that it's so hard. So next time now you're gonna build that confidence that allows you to say, you know what, that's I cannot do that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so yeah, that's part of the skill. And also on the bigger shoots, they give you you have a script, a script notes that give you some of the clips and the elements that you already know, scenes that are not you don't have to watch it. Are you, you getting most projects with selects already taken care of? Mm, some promos, yes. The, 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 the producer, and it depends on the producer. True. Some, some of them are awesome. They just give you the perfect cut because <laughs> they did. They just watch all the takes. Yeah. They have a great eye. You get the cut that they get. You know, it's the right one. Takes you five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> don't tell them. But <laughs> some others, some others, they just don't know. They say, I want one of that. When the guy says this, when the guy. So then now you have to go find the when the guy says. Yeah. You have to watch all those things. When you don't know the order of the questions. When you don't, you don't know, know yeah. what was asked, when was asked, how was so, asked. So, yeah, it's called, I mean, it's called a log. You know, they, usually they give you a log. So you have an idea what what was shot and when. 
and when was the best take. Mm -hmm. So that that really helps, and you learn to read those logs. So that's kind of it takes at least usually two days of prep. I mean, then depending on the le the, the length of the final product, but. You have that due diligence to do to take for two, three days. You stop your brain from being creative. You stop your brain from trying to, that's, I know that's the shot. That's the, that's when I, just don't do that. Just to get familiar with the footage, do your screening, pick your shots. And then everything, like I mentioned, is in the drawers. Don't rush it. And then, uh, and then you start the editing process. So it's more like left brain, right brain. Like you have mm -hmm. to switch, uh, just do like, just no creative to then now I can be creative. How do you get into quote unquote the zone when you're editing? That's awesome. The zone guy you should try it. <laughs> <laughs> the zone is awesome. The zone it's when you it's when you get everything that you know you need and now your brain is free from oh maybe there's something else. Or maybe I don't know. I think I no. You know if you got everything right there in your little bubble. And you're just juggling with those pieces that you put together, bing, bing. No, this one may be here. Let me add three frames, watch box. It gives me goosebumps as I'm talking. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you, you're right there. It. And then suddenly you get that click, that sound bite that just worked perfectly. Then the edit, you change a little bit. Then you bring that shot over here. You try this one. You, Man, that's what the zone name when you play with the music. And oh, my God. So what what does your environment look like? Are you somebody that like do you have like a playlist that you listen to? Do you no. have like some smells going on? You got some incense <laughs> being burnt? For me, playlist is pollution. Okay. Because when you're gonna need music or not need music, how can you it's like making food and you or drinking wine with chewing gum. Yeah. You know, I, like, I I know what you're coming from. And and maybe because a lot of what you worked on probably had had music or had vocals, but like you know, for no, me, no, like no, 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 I need, we need, I need music in everything I do. Yeah, true. But I'm saying, I guess what I'm getting is like, you know, there are days where like stuff that we work on is like, because you, have, sound you, you intensive. have a playlist, because you have a playlist. I have a playlist. <laughs> <laughs> Justin and I both, I'll call, we'll call each other, and all of a sudden, you know, we hear the music playing. No, in the I get background. you, I get you. No, no, no. It's, That's kind of where okay, I'm like, yeah, kind of yeah. getting at, like, what's your, what does your environment look like? I mean, my, I'm serious. I never have music playing. I get it. I, I mean, it's it's the right. And I'm not no no. It sounds sensitive. It but it's that's fine the right to, way to play. when you put especially the work you do again with your storyboards are so solid that you're putting the pieces together. So mm -hmm. there's no need to look for any zone. I mean, the zone comes once you know your edit is rough cut. I, that's why you the zone needs to find that zone where now you're no nothing nothing with the music. Now I just listen to the sound bites. Yep. That's how I do usually. I mean, every time. I start with an audio cut. Like first thing I do to get into my zone, I don't look at the video and I just play the audio of my cut. So that's going to give me the first rhythm of the cut, you know? And then that's when the, I'm going to add some, you know, move the sound bites a little bit, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, to get the right timing. Then I'm going to add maybe some sound effects, like if I need sound effects for some reason. And then that's when I'm going to start to bring some music in, you know? And that's when now you need, that's where the zone starts to come because, you know, the music, you have your spot that's playing in the loop in your head. With, and then you're going to start to bring some music or sound effects and then everything's going to really start to take shape or not. You know, you're going to feel like, oh, shit, no, that's not. And then slowly you get into that zone. And then when you get the right track, now you really start to finesse your editing and uh, add that one frame, that two frame that make the difference that nobody will ever talk about. But you know, but you know, you know, you know that it's uh, when I first started, this is a fun story. When I first started, I was making montages of like video game gameplay. Mm -hmm. I would purposely hide something in every single edit that I made. And it was only like, you know, to like a drop of a song. And it was like 20 seconds long, but I would always hide something. So like one, I had like a, it was like a sniping montage. And it was like 10, 11 kills in a row. And I had like a kill counter in the upper corner that would like animate with every kill, I would like comments, you know, oh, this is so cool. Love this, love this. I'm like, who's, where's my person that's going to notice that? <laughs> you know? I know. But, but like, that's the stuff that like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, ah, oh, like that's, that's yeah. what makes my soul happy at night knowing that like, cause nobody, it, it's like you said, it's, it dissolves in the whole edit because it's meant to be there. Yeah. But like in your head, you're like, that's my baby. That's I did that. Like, but at the same what... time, you know, that's, I like you said that because I forget to mention that when I talk about editing, like, sure, nobody's going to tell you the edit is bad or the edit is good, but the effect on them 
Yes. That's the thing, they, but they don't know. Like, you could show a bad edit, people are going to say, yeah, it's, it's a good movie. And with the same movie, with a good edit, it's going to become a great movie. And so that's the thing, like a feedback from someone, nobody is going to ever tell you, yeah, I don't know about the edit, it's really... Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so hard too to get judged on editing because who's going to give you again the right feedback about about the edit? Because unless someone really knows what they're talking about, you're you're on your own, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, learn by watching movies and watching like I did for many years, like watching trailers with no sound. Yeah. And then reverse just the sound. I got. Will you watch things that you think move fast? Turn the sound off. You can be like, it's not moving that fast. So the problem with that is like when you used to see. Hollywood trailers or music videos, things go so fast. Now in your edit, you're doing like four or five frame shot. Now turn the sound off. You're going to realize there's no four or five frame. It's usually between eight and 10. Right. That's the fastest. Yeah. But because you had the audio and the visual together, you think it's fast. So now your cuts are faster than they should be. Right. And you think it's cool, but it's not. Yeah, I, I think that's a very valuable thing for people to do is to do that. Turn it once oh my God. with just yeah. the sound and once with just... And and whether good or bad, I think it's important that people know that everything that they see has been done intentionally. Yes, yeah. And I think a, another piece is they can find a scene that they like, replay it. Why is everything? Yeah. Just start asking why. Why, yeah. why, why, yeah. why, why? Because then you're going to start to answer, okay, I get why this is done this way. I see why, you know, all of that comes together. And then when you play it in the hole, you're like, yeah. oh, now I see why this is done this way. Because there are some times where, like, you'll see something you're like, boy, that seemed jarring, but, like, in the grander scheme, it makes sense. Yeah, more than the word intentional, I would say purposely. Yeah. You know, it's been done intentionally, but with, there's a purpose. Yeah. Because it's going to match. Because I was so tempted when I studied editing in my... You want to throw bedroom. everything in oh, man, one the frame transition. And I like, love oh, it. my God. And the transition toolkit, yeah. you know, and, oh, my God, I, I would put transition in 100%. everything. Yeah. And I thought it was so cool. Yeah. Unless until someone at the balls went friend to tell me, you know, that's, <laughs> you can't do that anymore. <laughs> well, and that happened to me. And I'm like, am I just being lazy? And I'm like, no, maybe my taste has changed. Like, you feel lazy because <laughs> you're like, well, I'm not, every frame should have something. Every cut should have something. But like, no, no doesn't yeah, need to. That was a big thing that I went, sometimes we get compliments on some of my cuts and someone would ask me, some of those cuts were kind of unusual for the type of product we we're making. And some people were asking me, why are they, why, what do you think you did different? And when I worked in for a trailer, we were doing trailers and at the time everything was super fast. So I was bringing the opposite. I was being like longer shots. You know, I was not afraid to just stretch a shot a few more frames mm -hmm. and i would do that also with emotions I, I would love to do contrast in emotions where you bring the, the fear until that point where it's too much and then you just Smash stop it yeah and uh, you go to another emotions to laughter or to like dark light dark 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 and then boom you go to something bright you know so you just stretch that's when you're in the zone you feel it like oh shit i'm getting scared that's too disturb before you can even say the word disturbing you stop showing. The, you're already on. Yeah. So the people, that's what you got to be in people's mind where they're like, okay, this is getting, not even boring anymore because I'm already gone. Yeah. You know, so you just keep enough. So again, with experience with balls, because especially when you show something that that's not really what people are expecting, it takes balls, you know? Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's what I, and that's when the, the way I would make my cuts different, pushing, you know, just the limit of emotions and visual contrasts but also to just jump sorry on what i just said about you should always show the client what he asks you to yes to do and we, to know we talked about that you go. gotta i learned that the hard way because my producer i thought i had the super mega cut <laughs> for him i was so proud it was a good cut i'm sure the guy said he, that and the guy was stressed like we said what but what, what is the one from the script I said no but you give that a chance I said okay i will give it a chance but first show me yeah. my stuff and I didn't have it. So the guy was so pissed and I learned the hard way. So I had to recur this thing and then, then it was very nice. Come down and said, you know what? Fine. I appreciate that. But first show me what, because pretty much what's on paper is what I had. That's my brain. That's my vision. The client sees that. Give give it to them first. Your last line And then defense. you know what? Just so you know, I've got this to mm -hmm. show you. And don't, also another thing leads into editing. You got to be strong about what you just cut. 
about your edits? Do you have, you have to have an explanation you know, for any question? Why, do, why are we staying, staying so long on this code? Why didn't we use this one? What well, You should be strong by the firm, but not too much. You have to find the right, you know. Well, I think it's important you that, you that you have the conversation like, I chose this shot or I chose this because I feel if it's not within what they look for, then say, I'm fine with that. Like, I'm not married to it. I just thought, yeah. it, you know, from my shoes, this is where I thought this cut would be yeah. better suited. Always sell it with passion. Like, because yeah. a client also, a lot of clients, producers, they, they will go with you. If you sell your thing, they will go with you. You know, most difficult are like brands, you know, because brands, sometimes they have reason that you don't know about, you know. Strict guidelines. Yeah, great guidelines. But otherwise, in more creative, creative jobs, sell your thing, you know, but then know when to back, because I know so many editors that people don't want to work with because they just, they, they won't let go. Too bullish. I got to go. Yeah. Not even bullish. It just won't let go. You know, you have nice producer. You're going to be like, yeah, no, uh, let's go back to my, <laughs> and the guy's going to keep on selling his, selling his yeah. thing. And so, yeah, know when to, you have to be strong because they need it. Be strong, be firm, be, you know, that's my thing. I think it works. Make your offer and then let go. So we th maybe like five answers just came out to that to this yeah. question. But what's something that you would tell people that are starting or trying to get into this space? We'll keep it broad, whether it's yeah. film editing, what have you. I mean, uh, first thing, the tool. You know, we sometimes forget it. cameras or keyboards. They are tools. So first, learn learn to use your tool quickly. Because again, one of my first experience, a guy told me, I don't care if you're a great editor, if you take too long, I'm not interested. You know, I don't have the budget for that. Learn them hot keys. Yep. Hot keys or whatever keys. Like, even if you don't have hot keys, just, you know what, do your gymnastic, do work, work, be fast. Yeah. Be fast with your camera to set up. Like, know your tool. You get, you know, on set, you got to know, make sure your batteries are, I know it's stupid, batteries are charged. I've got my I am SD so, card. Justin will back me on yeah, that. Yeah, no, you guys I'm are good. You so guys are good. I'm on him about that all the time. But know your know your gear. You know you don't have time when you have under pressure clients. Are, you know it's money for them. Even if it's not so much money for you, it's money for them. You know there's no gear that doesn't work. There's no I don't have the right cable. This so your gear gear know your gear. Know how to use it quickly because things will change on set. You know even if it's not on set, even if it's shooting a, a body is a short movie. You know things might change and you got a couple extras that do that for fun. They don't have time for you to, because you don't have the right, right. lens and you want to try this shot, they're going to be gone. You're going to be like, now only one actor. So know your tools, have the right tools with you. Don't over, over tool, over, over equip yourself, you know, be good at what you, be very good at what you're using. So same thing with editing, just be strong and fast, know your program because editing, that camera is, it's, it's made, it, it's shown, they show it. The way it's sold to sold the way it's sold to us, it's very easy to use. Everybody can yeah. make a movie, but, but that's not the real world, you know. You gotta go down the program with that the menu of the camera, the menu of the the, the, the editing software. You gotta the lights. You well, it's know. one part of the puzzle. It's one part of the puzzle. And that's the one that's very easy to master. It's just time you spend at home, you know, by yourself doing Take your camera, take your, yeah. go through your premiere, go through the menus, the living room. try to understand uh, all yeah. those. Uh, and then slowly, you know, the, the more confident you are with the tool, then you don't have to worry about the technical part of it. Then now you can be in the, in the zone very quickly because, you know, your fingers don't even think, you know. The menu, you know where everything is. You just, you know why you're changing the aperture. You know why you're trying this angle. You know why you're asking for 50 mil versus the 85 you know, because it makes sense. You you yeah. know, you already know what the 85 looks like versus the 50, you know. You don't just switch it to see, oh, how does it look? No, I want the 50 because I know what it looks like already, you know. It's not just to see, does it look better? No, I already know I want it tighter. I want it wider. You know, that's yep. Yep. the same thing with editing, you know. You know why you're looking for that tool. It's not just to try, how, how does it affect the sound if I do that? No, you know you pulling the drawer and you're in the kitchen, you're pulling the drawer for a spe specific knife, you know, you're just going, okay, why is it? Yeah. So that's mm, the first thing that I would say, like, and it's easy to do for anybody. So I want to kind of just, you can answer this as you please, if you even feel like you need an answer, but to kind of close, I just want to thank you for being a resource mm -hmm. to us because, you know, Justin and I are kind of 
chickens with our heads cut off a little bit. We're so tunnel vision, but you definitely open our eyes to a lot. And having you on set has been a blessing because you are poking, but in the best way possible. You know, we never take offense to anything or anything wrong way because you're just like, but what if, but what if? And we love that because it's all, we, we argue with that with each other all the time, especially now that we have <laughs> met you. Like, what if we do this? What if we do that? Why? And, 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 and having purpose with everything. So, you know, there's one story that always sticks out to me on that. Sh- there was a shoot that we hired you for that, you know, you basically pulled Justin and I aside and said, look, I don't care who it is, but one of you needs to have a voice. And one of you needs to be a voice to everybody that's here. So it was one of our first projects that had like a lot mm-hmm. of people more than what we're used to having. And I just, you know, that was such a valuable lesson to us. Now, every time Justin and I go out and shoot, we just always are having, there's so many things that, you know, whether it's budgeting, we've worked with you with, whether it's shots and, and why, why lighting and how we reflect mm-hmm. and how this and that set design, you know, there's so many things that we've learned from you that now are like second nature to us. And like That's this, right. it's so we just really appreciate what you've done for us being in a small city. And, and, you know, like I said, we're tunnel vision within our zip codes yeah, because yeah. it's, it's hard for You want to be so good in your city so that you can expand. But at the same time, that kind of works against you because then you become so constricted yeah, to the hard. world around you. So we appreciate you opening our world up and, you know, hopefully we get to yeah, take glad, more advantage yeah. of it outside of the city as time passes. But, we just appreciate all, you guys all are the doing resource. very good. That's why I'm here because I've been following you and yeah, I like what you literally do. at first, yeah. and then you know, yeah, no, <laughs> literally no, down the hall like, of spaces at uh, first. I, I like, I love, I know you guys are going to be up there. Sweet, we appreciate yep. that. So, uh, if you have anything that you feel like you want to part part the no, I mean just with, uh, yeah, in the city, like people really need to get together and understand. You know, we can work together, and it's not against like just like like we were trying to do get this. Creative people need mm-hmm. to get together to know that they're not alone, that they're not with a crazy brain that's always creating. And, you know, let's work, learn from each other, share. Like, it's more like sharing, like a sharing community, like sharing creation hub, like a hub of creators. Like, that's my dream. Like we talked about yep. having that big hangar house where all creators meet and exchange. And and even doesn't it only have to be filmmaking. It could be painters, it could be artists, writers, artists. Plain like, and simple. Just get that vibe together and... And that's it. And you guys keep doing what you're doing. You're doing very good. Appreciate that. Yep. Wherever you're watching or listening, give this a like, subscription, whatever works on the platform that you're on. Please do so. And maybe if you uh, send Xavier here a message, he'll send you his reel of when he was on Days of Our Lives. And you get to see yeah. young Xavier doing some acting work. We've seen it. We've seen it. We know it's out there. So <laughs> we'll uh, we'll let him decide who gets, who gets that key or not. But thank you so much for being on the episode. Thank you.